Welcome to Renaissance Invention. This exhibition explores Johannes Stradanus' Nova Aperta, a 16th century print series of 20 engravings representing novelty and invention. This short film explores three major innovations or inventions of the period and the processes involved in their development, printing, navigation, and the technology of warfare. Each segment is hosted by a Chicago scholar practitioner. I'm Jen Farrell. This is Star Shaped Press. I've run the studio since 1999. Uh, I do all letterpress printing and design. And the unique thing about the studio is that all of the work is done with antique metal and wood type that I've been collecting for the last 20 years. So the printing process was important at its time because it was the first time you could rapidly disseminate information, often in the languages that the lay people spoke. Uh, I would argue that it's just as important today as it was then, uh, including this particular process of letterpress. What I'm doing here at Starshape is very, very similar to what was done using the type, setting it all, proofreading it, putting it on the press, inking it, and pulling pages that could be viewed by anyone that can read that language. So in this image, uh, it's, it's kind of like looking at uh, what's wrong with this picture image, uh, because while this is a functioning print shop, it looks like the artist didn't actually fully uh, comprehend how the equipment actually works. So even in these common presses, there's these little uh, knobs and hooks that seem to go nowhere and do nothing, even though in theory some of this bed should be moving. Uh, we have the printer's devil or younger child here handling paper that he probably would not have been allowed to handle. And then we've got this guy setting type from what looks to be a flat case, and I'm not quite sure how there would actually be any type in it uh, since it has no dimension, whereas this guy over here has one that's incredibly deep that would hold uh, quite a bit of type, except that neither of these are laid out in any way that makes sense in terms of how the Latin alphabet works uh, and where the letters would actually be. So it's, not, it's close, but it's not quite there. They are actually printing, and it looks to be book pages uh, that are hanging here to dry and then waiting to be bound. So there is actually some work being done, uh, and it looks like there's peace in the valley because despite all the weapons, none of them are being used. You see the printers working on common presses, and this is a little bit different than the technology that I'm working with now. I have presses that were made in the 20th century and were designed specifically to output work at a much higher rate than what the printers were doing with their common presses. Uh, and while that process is a little bit different, a little faster and more streamlined, it's essentially using a lot of the same equipment to achieve the same goal. My name is Peter Raposo. I'm a historian of science specializing in the history of astronomy. I am a curator and director of collections at the Adro Planetarium here in Chicago. I'm standing next to an Hermillary sphere. This Hermillary sphere in particular contains elements from the 18th century and the 19th century, but the Hermillary sphere is a much older instrument. It was widely used in the Middle Ages as a teaching and demonstrational instrument, and it is essentially a model of the Earth-centered cosmos. So we have the Earth at the center of the instrument, then the Earth is surrounded by a movable framework of rings, and these rings represent imaginary circles in the sky that that help us understand and keep track of the basic celestial motions. In the America print, you see an explorer holding an instrument like this, a Marinus astrolabe. You can see this instrument in this gallery. This Marinus astrolabe dates from the 17th century and was found in a shipwreck of Nuestra Senora de Tosha, which sank off the Marquesas Keys. Uh, in Florida in 1622. Marinus astrolabes were used on ships to find latitude. And the way they work, so a sailor would be holding the instrument like this. This is a heavy instrument. It weighs over six pounds. It's made of brass. And you see that it has these holes. So the idea of the holes is to let the wind go through so that it doesn't disturb the observation. The instrument has two angular divisions, one here and another here, and the movable piece, which is called the alidate. And you can see that the alidate has two veins, and each vein has a pinhole. This instrument could be used either to observe the pole star or the sun. 
If a sailor was observing the sun, uh, he would not look directly at the sun, but he would align the elidate with the sun so that the sun rays uh, went through the two pinholes. And when that happened, he would read the angle between the sun and the horizon uh, on this scale. And then he could use tables to calculate the latitude of the ship. I'm Jonathan Tavares, Associate Curator of Arms, Armor, and European Decorative Arts at the Art Institute of Chicago. Stradonis' uh, plate of the armor polishes is an incredible visual resource about something that's very little known um, in documentation from uh, the 16th century. Uh, so armor polishing uh, was a very rigorous process using multiple grinding wheels, uh, often either attached to a water-driven mill, as we're seeing uh, in Stradonis' plate, or perhaps wind, or more especially also animals, uh, driving a cam action to rotate the wheel. And they constantly need to dress the wheel. Uh, in some accounts, we hear something called white soap that's bought by the pound uh, to temper uh, the rotating wheel. And we actually see little jars next to the polishers uh, aside the rotating wheels. Here I have a, uh, a 16th century breastplate from Italy, probably about 1580, about the same time as the print. Uh, and what we have here is sort of a rare occurrence where we do see the evidence uh, of the original polish, uh, which is not altogether gone. This is a common soldier's uh, breastplate to some degree. It, it weighs uh, about um, seven or eight pounds. Uh, a complete armor might weigh uh, about uh, 50 to 60 pounds. But if we look closely at the surface here, uh, we see grinding marks from the coarse wheel. Uh, and it has not completely been polished away, uh, either from the uh, buffing wheel uh, that was subsequent or from centuries of later polishing. So we're lucky to be able to see this. And you can see they're all parallel marks up and down horizontally across the surface. Uh, and what that was all attempting to do was essentially to get rid of what we see on the inside, which is the rough steel plates, the hammer marks, uh, which is very coarse, uneven. So the purpose of the grinding was to make a nice smooth surface for glancing blows. So stirrups uh, came to Europe sometime probably in the ninth century, and they were absolutely uh, a more modern invention uh, as opposed to what the ancients had. There are a lot of theories about stirrups and how they helped uh, create a different tactical advantage uh, to the use of lances and spears uh, from horseback, that it actually helps you seat into your horse and have more force behind the lance. And certainly it seems that Stradonis is suggesting that too. In the background, uh, you see a figure actually holding a lance while being in their saddle uh, and feet into the stirrups. Uh, the thought is perhaps that gives you a little better purchase onto the horse and more force behind the lance. Uh, modern um, experimentation, though, has shown, uh, on the contrary, it's just about the same.